Hello, friends, and welcome back to another Bible study from the Tanakh, the Old Testament, in which we will examine how Yehoshua ben Nun, or Joshua the son of Nun, is perhaps the most perfect biblical type or foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. And what I mean by a biblical type is someone or something that is an explicit or implicit prefiguring of someone else namely Jesus Christ and his mission of saving lost sinners through his suffering of the cross. And why are these types and shadows important to know? Because they lend evidence to the deity of Jesus of Nazareth and the fulfillment of his coming as foretold by the writers of the Old Testament. And let me say that Christological typology, as it is referred to, is an important area in biblical hermeneutics the branch of knowledge used to interpret the scriptures. And it is my hope that through this study you will appreciate, even discover on your own, the types and shadows of Christ in the scriptures. Now, Joshua's story spans from the 17th to the 33rd chapter of the book of Exodus and continues on from the 11th chapter of the book of Numbers through to the end of the book of Deuteronomy and of course, throughout the book that bears his name, the book of Joshua. And based on that, we can say that Joshua is a major figure of the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, or the Torah. Now, his narrative has largely been used in children's Sunday school, perhaps due to his greater-than-life persona that is devoid of sordid details written in the narratives of the other great characters of the Bible. So for children, Joshua, son of Nun, becomes the perfect exemplar of faithfulness and righteousness, the ideal role model for youth. Yet this is not to say that Joshua was a perfect man, as was Jesus of Nazareth. For as Paul emphasized, there is none righteous, no, not one, Romans 3.10, and all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, verse 23. And although Joshua is portrayed as a faithful servant of God, he needed a savior to atone for his sin, as with all of us. And let me say that what is most significant in Joshua's story is that it contributes an essential piece of the revelation of the God of Israel. And as you know, revealing the true God of creation to the nations is the point of the scriptures. And what is revealed through Joshua's narrative is that Jehovah is a God who keeps his promises to his people and his promise to establish a homeland for Israel in Canaan was kept. Now, some of the other widely recognized types of Christ in the Old Testament is Noah and saving his household from the flood, Hebrews 11, 7, as is David who prefigures Christ as the shepherd king of Israel. Elijah is also recognized as a type of Christ in that he was a worker of miracles and called God's people to repentance and righteousness. And like Christ, he was rejected by everyone and a man of sorrows. And Jonah stands as a type of Christ in that as he was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so was Christ in the grave three days and three nights. And interestingly, after Jonah was expelled from the fish, he went to preach to the Gentiles in Nineveh. Well, after Jesus resurrected from the grave, those he discipled went and preached to the Gentiles throughout the Roman Empire. And then there are objects that serve to foreshadow Christ, such as the bronze serpent raised up by Moses in the wilderness that saved Hebrews from death, from snake bite, Numbers 21.9 a foreshadowing of the cross of Christ that saves sinners from spiritual death, Hebrews 11:17, And thought to be the most perfect foreshadowing of Christ's sacrificial death is the sacrificial system of ancient Israel, Hebrews 9, 15 through 28. There are recognized many characters from Adam to Melchizedek. Uh, from Joshua to Elijah, as types of Christ. And it is this Christological typology and that bears witness of his deity and mission, particularly to the Jews. Unfortunately, the types and shadows that point to Jesus of Nazareth as Jehovah's Messiah has steered rabbis away from teaching from the Old Testament, instead 
focusing on the interpretive body of rabbinic literature that include the Talmud, Mishnah, and Zohar that attempt to explain away the obvious and enforce the lies told about Christ. That all said, let us now discover how Joshua is the perfect type of Christ, examining the most significant points of comparability between this heroic character and Jesus of Nazareth. And let us begin by noting that there is no coincidence in their shared name, Joshua or Yehoshua in Hebrew, which means Yehovah is salvation. Yehoshua, son of Nun, from the Hebrew Bible, has been translated in the Greek version of the Bible, the Septuagint, to Jesus. But in the English Bible, his name is interpreted Joshua. However, Jesus, from the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, has been translated to Jesus in English. So Joshua and Jesus have the same Hebrew name and Greek translation of it but differ in the English versions. Our second point of comparability between Joshua and Jesus is that they are both referred to as servants, with Joshua having been Moses' servant, Exodus 24, 13, and later declaring himself to be God's servant, and I quote, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24, 15. And Jesus emphasized his role as servant, saying to his disciples, And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Matthew 20, 28. And the Apostle Paul understood Jesus' role as servant, evident in his letter to the church at Philippi, and I quote, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with him, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of a man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. And so had the prophet Isaiah before him, who foretold of the suffering servant, Jehovah's Messiah, found in chapters of Isaiah 42, 49, 50, and 53 the last of which is referred to as the forbidden chapter by unbelieving Jews, since it explicitly points to God's Messiah who was rejected and abused, which points to Christ's betrayal and crucifixion. Isaiah referred to Christ as the arm of the Lord, prophesying, and I quote, He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Isaiah 53, 3. And today Israel on the whole continues to ignore and despise Jesus Christ. And moving on to our third point of comparability is that as Joshua, son of Nun, was called by Jehovah to save Israel from Gentile influence and aggression, Jesus, the Son of God, was sent to save sinners from spiritual darkness and the devil. Yet I have to say that as mighty Joshua was in leading and preserving Israel, there are differences in that his accomplishment was temporal and temporary, while Jesus' saving sinners is spiritual and eternal. And although Joshua led around two million of Israelite men, women, and children out of the wilderness into the promised land, Jesus has led countless of millions out of every nation for the past 2,000 years from spiritual darkness to the eternal promised land.
Now, the fourth point of comparability is that Joshua is a perfect type of Christ and that he obeys his spiritual father, Moses, to go and to fight the enemies of the Hebrews. As Jesus obeyed the call of his father to conquer the enemy of all mankind, death and Satan, and Joshua and Jesus, both having been surrendered to the will of God, resulted in their victory. In the book of Exodus, Moses commissions his servant Joshua to muster up a militia to go and fight the Amalekites in response to their unprovoked attack in Rephidim, to which Joshua submitted. Now, given that the Amalekites settled east of the Jordan River, where you see the red outline on the right side of the frame, it appears that they went out of their way to attack the Hebrews in Rephidim in the red outline on the left side of the frame. And as some suggest, the Amalekites were attempting to block the Hebrews from the water at the Rephidim oasis. And let me say here that the Amalekites were descendants of Jacob's brother Esau. And this would be the first of several battles the Israelites would fight against their blood relations. And beginning in verse 8 of Exodus 17, it says, Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And jumping down to verse 13, it says, so Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And as Joshua obeyed Moses, Jesus obeyed his father, declaring, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak, and I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. John 12, 49 to 50. And again, Jesus said, But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. John 14, 31. And from the beginning, Joshua and Jesus started off on their mission in similar manner by being empowered by the Holy Spirit. Joshua was empowered when Moses anointed him to lead Israel in his absence, and Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit as his, at his baptism to lead Israel to their redemption. In the book of Deuteronomy, it is said of Joshua, and I quote, Now Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. So the children of Israel heeded him, and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. Deuteronomy 34, 9. After Joshua was anointed by Moses, he led Israel into the promised land with wisdom and might to subdue the Canaanites, while after Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit, he led souls into the kingdom of God with signs and wonders. The prophet Isaiah wrote of God's Messiah, and I quote, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. Isaiah 42, 1. The anointing of the Holy Spirit on Joshua empowered him to rid Canaan of its demon-worshipping inhabitants, while Jesus was empowered to de defeat Satan's hold on the people through disease, demons, and death. And the fifth point of comparability is that Joshua, as a type of Christ, can be recognized in his good character. For like Christ, he was consistently selfless, humble, faithful, and courageous. And that was not consistently found even in Moses, who although had been mostly faithful throughout his life, he, like most of us, occasionally failed to do what God had commanded. Even Abraham buckled under the pressure of his wife, Sarah, to take her servant, Hagar, as a surrogate, in spite of Jehovah's promise that Sarah would bear him a son. And although King David is a recognized type of Christ, he proved to be faithless in his adulterous relationship with Bathsheba and setting up her husband, Uriah, to be killed. 
So it can be said that Joshua stands as the perfect type of Christ in regard to his character and behavior. And due to that, following Moses' death, Jehovah began to speak to Joshua directly as he had with Moses and as Jesus had with his father. And Jehovah instructing Yeshua uh, to take possession of Canaan, saying, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua 1, 1 through 9. And this God-spoken encouragement is for all of us. And it was due to Joshua's faithfulness and his strong leadership that Israel became faithful as well. And I quote, Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had known all the works of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. Joshua 24, 31. And as for Jesus Christ, it is no wonder that countless millions have given their lives over to him for the past 2,000 years, having lived according to his teachings and having trusted in him for their salvation. And it is no wonder that millions of us continue to do that today. And the sixth point of comparability is as Joshua was a mighty conqueror for Jehovah, Jesus is coming back as the mightiest of all conquerors to destroy all that is evil in the world. John wrote in his apocalyptic work, the book of Revelation, beginning in chapter 19, verse 11, and I quote, now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except him. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. So what about you? Have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If you have not, I urge you to do that today, for we don't know when he will return for those who are his, who are called by his name. Like Joshua, enter in and own the eternal land of promise that Jehovah has for those who are redeemed by the shed blood of his only begotten Son. Jesus, repent of your sins, turn away from the darkness around you, and begin to follow Christ. And when you do, you will receive the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that will enable you to remain faithful until the day that the Lord takes you home. Your eternal destination is up to you. Thank you for viewing this study. And please subscribe to my channel and hit that bell for notifications of my weekly Bible studies. Be greatly blessed in all areas of your lives as you draw close to Jesus.
the mightiest of the mighty, the king of all kings, the savior of the world.